Yeah, yeah. Either way. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, How was your process? It just says it's going to be a survey. And then, um, but we have these three great people who've traveled from various distances to join us uh, to have a conversation about the crisis in casting. And we've all looked over some material and had very brief preliminary conversations. So structurally, I thought what I would do is sort of just start us with some questions and really basically then leave it to you three, hopefully four, and all of you to join in. Technically, we only have an hour, right? We have this space, I think the space is booked shortly after us, so we'll begin. Hi, I'm Amelia Ben Susan. I should start there. I'm Chair of Performing Arts, and along with my colleagues in Visual Media Arts, I see Brooke in the back of my Chair of VMA, we thought what was most appropriate for our departments to host as a conversation on this teaching day um, was this conversation about casting, which has had enormous ramifications for our professions as well as is an active dialogue in both our departments and I know I told our panelists that I thought our audience was composed of actors, directors, screenwriters, playwrights, theater directors, film directors, all of you, um, the potential casting directors and other voices that will be shaping media and theater in the future. So that um, we wanted all your voices on it. So, so first is Destiny Lily, a casting director who hails from New York, who does a lot of casting for films, student films, professional work, etc. I'll let people do further introductions of themselves. Mike Blue, gifted playwright who is right now in previews of the Huntington for his play, so we're thrilled that you're here in the middle of an exhausting rehearsal stretch, and we look forward to seeing the production. And Joe Wilson, Jr., who comes to us from Providence, where he's been a company member at Trinity Repertory Theater. And so we're glad to have, I feel like, you know, to have all three of you in Boston right now is really a, a great opportunity. And, and terrific for all of us to hear this conversation. Um, why don't I just start off with, if, with a question that Joe and I started discussing right outside, which is you were talking about how this conversation around casting and race has really changed during the times you, during the years you've worked as a professional. 
Yes, I'll give you guys a quick sort Here's of... Because you're like, who Thanks. are you? <laughs> 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 oh, I know that was great. It's like something. You have to uh, stop me from talking. Oh, and we also should say we're live streaming right for HowlRound. So hello to everyone watching us through HowlRound. <laughs> so, go um, ahead. Just to give you a quick of who I am. Uh, my name is Joe Wilson, Jr. Uh, I am from New Orleans originally. Um, I went to graduate school. Uh, I, I went to uh, undergrad at the University of Notre Dame. I have a degree in political science, but I went on to graduate school uh, and received a master's in fine arts and acting from the University of Minnesota Guthrie Theater Training Program. Um, I worked in Minneapolis uh, for seven years, including my training there. Wait, Joe, you're supposed to grab a mic. Oh, sorry. Use the mic. I can use the mic. And I'm just trying to figure out the schedule. I paid all this talking. money to project, and I'm assuming that is. <laughs> um, that's better? Um, I hail from New Orleans, Louisiana. I went to the University of Notre Dame for uh, in graduate uh, 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 undergrad um, in political science, uh, and then I found myself in acting. That's a whole other story. But uh, so I chose to go to graduate school, University of Minnesota Guthrie Theater Training Program. I worked in Minneapolis until 2000. Uh, in 2000, I moved to New York. Uh, did my first Broadway show, uh, Superstar on Broadway, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. I lived and worked in New York until 2005. The old joke is you moved to New York to work outside of New York. So in one of my jobs, um, I was hired as a freelance actor to work at Trinity Rep uh, in a production in 2005, directed by Kent Gash, a, pl a musical called Ain't Misbehavin'. Um, I then, uh, that was actually also Oscar Eustace's last season uh, at Trinity before he moved to the public. Um, but then they cast me again to do a little play called Top Dog Underdog. Uh, by Susan Lori Parks, uh, myself and my co-star Cass Kemnu. Uh, we actually flip-flopped roles every other night. Uh, so we played both parts in this two-person play, which was a bitch. Um, uh, and then they asked me to join the company. Um, and so I said, sure. Um, as everything in my life, I just jumped right in. And so I have been in the company now for 12 years. Uh, this is my 12th season. Um, why this is intriguing to me, is, and I can talk a lot about this, but I'm just going to try and uh, hone on one particular uh, incident. Um, I am from a, a classically training, training pro classical training program where the idea was, um, and to find myself in a theater, that multicultural, cross-cultural, gender, colorblind, whatever you want to call it, casting, we were doing this since the 60s. We were doing it before anyone knew what to call it. Uh, we had black people playing white people, we had women playing Scrooge, we had men playing, we just, that was Adrian Hall's original concept. The idea was he didn't care who you were, where you came from, but his attraction was to a good actor. A good actor. And so even coming into Trinity, and my dear friend Barbara Meek, who passed last year, who was in the company since the 60s, a black woman, she would hate it when I classified myself as an, as an actor of color. She's like, Joe, you're a good actor. Um, but what Barbara and I disagree on is every role that I approach, I can't deny the fact that I am an African-American gay man in that part. That's, 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 my palette of paints rests on that, that of who I am. And so I'm approaching every role from, from that lens and then finding my in through being a black gay man from New Orleans, single with a dog and blah, 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 blah. There's no such thing as colorblind when I am, when a play is put in front of me. I have to find my way in. Um, and just fast forwarding, and we can talk, y'all can ask me whatever you want. Um, I, well, this came to a head for me in my career, and being in a place that allowed me to play everything from Willie Stark and All the King's Men, to Scrooge, to Walter Lee Younger in A Raisin the Sun, to all the classics I do. No one asks me, we, we, we talk rarely about race in our room. That has changed. Um, it has changed as a result of um, my being cast last year as Judd Fry in Oklahoma. Um, and that was a hot mess. Um, it was a hot mess because our theater was in the midst of talking about race in very specific ways because we produced something last year called the Every 28 Hour Plays, uh, and those were plays directed from Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, that began a, a, a continued discussion about race in our theater. Uh, previously in that season, we did a production of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird in conversation with Blues from Mr. Charlie, and following the tradition of our, excuse my French, fucking with casting, we, did some, we made some casting choices in that show that were highly controversial. And then that led us to Oklahoma. Um, my being cast as Judd Fry really angered some folks um, because specifically of the smokehouse scene in which you had an African-American Judd Fry who was being asked by a white curly to hang himself. Um, and the specific folks were a couple of, of, of the new institutes. The specific folks who, who started this discussion, yes. 
Yes, uh, we have a, a training program, a graduate actor training program through Brown University. And one of our incoming, incoming graduate students who happened to live in Providence because her girlfriend, I shouldn't say that, because she was involved with someone who was also in school in Providence, uh, took issue with the production. Um, and it began, she began a series of protests around that show. Um, and so for the, the, the theater had to come to grips with dealing with this issue around race and casting in a way that we had not in a very long time uh, because we pride ourselves on focusing on actor-driven work and not thinking about the political, social ramifications of having a black person in a particular role. Um, and so that um, we're in the midst of dealing with that right now. We're still uh, not dealing with that. I shouldn't say dealing with that. We're in the midst of learning how to speak about this in a new way. Um, our theater, because we are a, 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 a resident acting company, we're in Providence, uh, we are in some ways off the grid and in some ways on the grid. And being off the grid has allowed us to be able to do a variety of things without the hot light of, of judgment and critique. Um, and so while this discussion has been shocking and jarring to the institution, it is a conversation that we're all welcoming because it's a conversation that we have to have and that I welcome having. Uh, because as we ask people of color to come into our white institutions. We cannot bamboozle them by welcoming them into our spaces and being then irresponsible in the kinds of images that we present to them. An image to you may be a completely different image to her and the impact on her. And that's something that we're now learning. And I know it seems like, well, hell, y'all should have known that for a very long time since you, we've been around for 53 years. But you guys, this is a very new conversation in terms of what we can and can't do around casting, especially when we are in already a crappy profession where people want to work and there are no roles for people of color. And so we're always having to make those kinds of choices between either working or not working, paying the rent or not paying the rent, raising the family or not having kids. Can I afford to have a dog? Will I ever own a home? Or should I get out the business? So we're making real life artistic choices and financial choices and social choices and all these things. So I hope this discussion can be a conversation about, about all of those things. Whether you're a director or a producer or an actor, all of us have to make decisions, not only based upon making good art, but we have to make these decisions in concert with good social policy. We have to, because we will be irrelevant as an art form if, we don't, or if we're not more sensitive to the very people that we're trying to attract to invest in what it is that we do. And I've talked too much. Thank you. Thank That's you. a very beginning Thank joke. Thank you. And I would just throw in this quote from, um, from this past Sunday's New York Times. I don't know if anybody saw. There was a, the back page of the Times Magazine was an interview with Asif Manvi, um, who I directed a lifetime ago in a production of Taming of the Shrew. But, you know, at Merchant of Venice. But that's another story. Um, and the New York Times asked him, apropos what Joe is saying, You've spoken about how the limited number of roles available to South Asian and Middle Eastern actors can put them in a bind about accepting roles that might enforce stereotypes. Are there any roles that you regret taking? Asif Mandi's answer is, I don't regret taking any roles. There are roles that I would look back on now and think, oh boy, I wouldn't do that anymore. But at the time, I had to pay the bills. I realized it was actually through that it was actually through that I can, in some small way, be instrumental in trying to move that conversation into a different place, where you have brown characters who actually are the source of the story, mm -hmm. rather than just adjacent brown people in a predominantly white world. So over to you, Mike. So tell us about your work and some of, your, some of the things you've said philosophically about how your work and other work of artists of color should perhaps be produced. Hi, uh, so I'm a playwright. Um, I grew up in San Diego and then uh, have been in New York for the past uh, around 15 years. Um, I also am the co-director of Mahi Writers Lab, which is the largest collective of Asian American playwrights ever assembled in the history of recorded time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the uh, and then the reason that I'm in Boston right now is because my play Tiger Style is going up um, at the Huntington, and uh, so we have first preview tonight, and we run through November 13th. So uh, y'all should check it out. Uh, and the reason that uh, I'm here today, I think, is uh, twofold. Um, within my own uh, plays, uh, I'm constantly navigating the sort of politics of like, what do I put inside of my plays in terms of representation and. Uh, what's pressing for me, um, sort of what uh, stories do I want to tell, um, and how much do I want to steer into you know, being an Asian American artist and sort of uh, 
creating Asian American characters as opposed to um, not, and that's something that all of the writers within my year are really slamming our heads against because there's a wide variety of um, of what we do aesthetically, politically, so like in our art. And then uh, the longer that I've been a playwright, the more that I've started to think about the politics that are sort of outside of your work because you as a playwright are just kind of making your individual plays, but then it, those plays live in an ecosystem. And so then um, I am uh, part of the Dramatist Guild Council, which is uh, uh, like a sort of governing body for playwrights, um, and uh, it, within my year have been doing uh, a lot of works of activism around casting, uh, just in terms of, uh, yeah, like how Asians are represented are sort of thinking about diversity and, and um, how to widen the range of narratives that are being told on our stages, because I think that uh, uh, as far as like our work, that there's a potential trap of um, uh, presenting your, like having plays that uh, confirm preconceptions about uh, who we are as opposed to like sort of uh, an authentic and nuanced version of who we are and how to get our work out there and, and sort of get people to widen the kind of lens that they're viewing us through. Right, thank you, Mike. And I do wanna come back um, to this idea of widening the range of narratives and how we do that in some cases Hey, I'm Destiny Lilly. Um, I'm a casting director, and I work primarily in film and digital media. I have a background in theater, though. I started out, like some of you, I was in college and wanted to be an actor. And by the time I graduated, I realized I didn't want to play maids my whole life, and so I changed the <laughs> course. No, really, that's true. Um, but I think that if I were in college now, I wouldn't have that same choice to face. You know, that a lot has changed in a relatively short period of time. Uh, which I think is great. And I feel like, you know, working in casting, I've been able to be a small, small part of that. Um, but <laughs> there's still a really, really long way to go in terms of the types of roles that are offered, and so much <laughs> has changed, but, and I think it's important for us to look at that, but there's still a lot of progress to be made, and still a lot of understanding that I think people often don't understand why representation is important or what it means to feel represented. When you've been represented your whole life, it, it, you don't realize how rare that is for a lot of other people. You know, and how it wasn't until I was maybe in my 20s that I really felt like I saw anyone who was similar to me in like any kind of media which is a long time to not see yourself reflected back, and that's like changing. Um, but yeah, I consider myself both like an artist and an advocate for uh, inclusion. I'm also on the board of New York Women in Film and Television, and so I'm a hardcore advocate for equality for women in the industry, because as you guys all know, we have a long way to go on that too. Um, so yeah, and I'm happy to be here. Um, you brought up, uh, do I need to be, I I'm always so loud that the idea of a mic just shocks me. Um, it, you had brought up the Tim Burton article that you had sent me when I asked you for different, you know, when I asked all of us to contribute ideas on how to start the conversation. And that brought up the issue of how color does speak, not unlike some of the things that Joe brought up that happened at Trinity. Do you want to touch on that in terms of what happens when, when choices are made around um, <coughs> a certain ethnic casting <coughs> deliberateness? Not a great use of words there, but. Sure, I think that um, for a long time, working in casting, like, you know, I'm still like relatively new, but a lot of people have worked in casting for a long time, in a casting notice, unless race was specified, it was default white. Mm. Um, you know that's true. Mm -hmm. Right, so, <laughs> like, so, the idea is it's like there are like regular people and then there's like other people, you know? Because if it wasn't specified, that meant that it was white. Right. And slowly, slowly over time that has slightly changed somewhat. Um, and you'll see more roles that are deliberately open or deliberately, okay, we're looking for, you know, maybe a white guy or a black guy. Like it, there is a bit more openness, but I think that you still have this idea, and this applies to gender as well, where there's like a story, and then there's a black story, or an Asian story. 
And there's an idea that like if the story is about mostly white people, it's just a story. And if a story is about mostly black people, mostly Asian people, mostly Latino people, then that's like a black story or an Asian story. Or it's like four Asian people or four black people. Uh, whereas a story is for everyone. So that is something that I don't think is changing. Comes back to, you know, um, the tone deafness of that uh, quote, and I don't want to misquote him, but basically what Tim Burton said is, yeah, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't incredibly articulate, but basically he was pointing out that you know his fantastical story that is not even set in reality. This one, things are either things. Yeah, he said things either call for things or they don't. And then he went on to talk about how, like, if he watched a black exploitation movie, he wouldn't be like, where are the white people? Right. But what that what that brings home is, so in this fantasy world that he's created, it doesn't call for people who aren't white. And it's like, well, we're getting into this territory of an idea that, like, whiteness is the default setting and everything right. else is custom, mm -hmm. right. which is a dangerous place to be, which is a place that we've been in for a long time and that I think we are slowly but surely moving out of. Um, I'm a part of a group called Origins that is specifically about <coughs> black science fiction and horror and like film and television. And people are always like, whoa, black people in science fiction? Like it's like blowing their mind. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, like that's a thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> There's lots of people who think, but it's like, whoa, those things together? So I think that, you know, as tone deaf as that statement can be, I don't think that a lot of people have been pushed to think about race as something that is just like part of who everybody is. Right. And a story, if something's just a story, then it can include people of all right. different backgrounds. Like it doesn't have to be like, it's a story. Yeah. It can include we, everybody. Angela Davis was here a few weeks ago. We had the honor of hearing, I think, and she said at the Berkeley event, I know she said, we've decided that human is by default white and male. Mm. <laughs> and that, you know, and that everything else is then added on, so. Questions, do you want to throw in some questions? Yeah. So would you, uh, would you suggest um, in a casting notice to, to write like something that specifies that this is a racially open? Yeah, so Tell basically, um, so though. one of the things that I do is I, I, I work at the School of Visual Arts and I teach students how to write casting breakdowns as part of what I do. Um, and I, and this is what I do, so I'm not saying this is what everybody does, this is what I do as someone who's consciously aware of these things. I think if gender is important to the role, you specify. If you're open, you specify that you're open. It, same thing with race. If race is important to the role, you specify. If you're open, you specify that you're open. Um, and I think that that's important. But I also think that actors have to be advocates for themselves. And not everyone is necessarily as conscious of this as I am. And I think it's important for actors to reject the idea of default whiteness and say, well, this doesn't specify, so I'm applying for it. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter, it's like, well, you know, because, because you never know when, you know, you're gonna apply for something, somebody's like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Because a lot of the time it's not like, it's not conscious discrimination. Sometimes people just haven't thought of it. And then they get like the one headshot from like the one Asian actor that decided to apply for this like non-specific role and they're like, Oh, yeah, maybe, no, I hadn't thought of this. And it starts to, to hopefully move that conversation forward. But I do think it's important also to have specific work. I don't think everything should be open because there are stories that are specifically about people from specific countries or people from specific backgrounds. And I don't want to create a world that is that doesn't have that specificity, because that's really important culturally as well. Can, can I pass the same question on to the two of you, so your perspectives on this? Yeah, um, in my place, like, uh, so for Tiger Style, it says casts Asian actors to play Asian characters, great. And uh, and it's it's not like, I mean, the 
the characters are Chinese American, but it's not uh, apparently intrinsically obvious that you would necessarily cast Asian actors, I guess, because I have a friend, Lloyd Sa, who's played Jesus in India, which takes place in India, got cast in a university production with uh, white people playing Indians, which uh, was not his intention and uh, kind of offensive to South Asians. And um, so, I, and, and, they have, and that production yeah, got shut down because they weren't honoring the intention of the writer. Um, I also have a play called Teenage Dick, which is an adaptation of Richard III that takes place in high school, and, um, and it says cast disabled actors to play disabled characters because uh, within uh, the disabled community, I'm, a, I'm able-bodied, so I'm speaking for people. That are, like, I think that there's a lot of um, sort of able-bodied actors that are using disability as some kind of metaphor for triumph, which like defies uh, their lived experience, and so. Um, in order to, you know, if you want to do this play, you have to find disabled actors to do it. Um, so yes, I think that it should be specified. I think that your question, though, also kind of points to these like sort of multiple um, prong, like like sort of multiple ent entry points of, of potential bias. Because it's like, as artists, when we're creating our work, like we have potential biases in terms of how we're thinking about these characters and um, and uh, sort of how we want to portray the world. And there's places that, you know, blind spots that we have that we're not sort of making stories that are inclusive, but then when you put that piece of art out, you know, like to production companies or to uh, to theaters, um, the casting director potentially has biases in terms of like their favorite actors and maybe not, you know, casting as wide of a net as possible for each individual role. And then audience members have biases in terms of how they think that, you know, you know that these roles should be portrayed. All of which is just to say that um, there's, this is a very, complex problem and that uh, specifying the role is like one part of a very large sort of puzzle that like, so I mean, in, in regards to the Tim Burton uh, article, I mean, I think that it's great that uh, audiences are so passionate about, um, about films to the point that they're, you know, that they're really chiming in about, you know, how they feel about um, something that was in their head that when it gets, you know, sort of made concrete is completely different from what they thought of. Um, so I've been following a lot of these, just like in um, uh, in Hunger Games, like over uh, uh, I can't remember the character's name, uh, but uh, and and like the latest sort of Harry Potter, like uh, you know uh, the, the theater, Hermione right? The Hermione, Hermione, right? Like so, yeah. I, I just think that it's great that um, there's feedback within audiences, and I think that you vote with your dollars, and you also sort of you know vote with social media, but that I think reinforces that we're hungry for you know shifts. As an actor, Joe, what do you go in for? What are what what, what turns you off or, or or allows you to enter a room really openly on a casting breakdown? First of all, you guys have said so much that I agree with, and we could go off in an hour on either fast several facets of what you talked right. about in this question. First of all, I agree that in speaking from an actor point of view, we aren't sometimes given the luxury or provide the luxury with thinking about these things in this way because again, like I said in the beginning. Being an actor, especially, you know, being an actor, it's a crappy, crappy business. Um, and so we sometimes don't give ourselves the luxury or have the space and time to be able to think about some of these big questions around casting because you simply want to work and you want to be able to, to, to hone your craft. Um, but I think I'm going to answer that question by saying, too, if there are any actors in this room, even all of you as artists, that we have to think about these things because what being a part of a a regional theater, a resonant theater company has taught me is that as I move more out of commercial theater, that my art making is hand in hand with my advocacy work in my community. That my art making is a social service. My art making is a public service. That I'm not just making plays to make plays, but I'm looking to make plays and make work that's in conversation with what my community is talking about. Okay. We have to stop thinking about ourselves as somehow providing, you know, that we're part of this thing where art's a luxury item. That, pe that it's for rich people to pay money and go and see it if you can afford it. That, you know, art making is a critical way that we communicate as human beings. Art making makes us human. Art making is, 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 is a fundamental way that we communicate to each other as people to reflect what it is that we feel and see. We are all artists in that capacity. To me, creativity and being creative is as much about breathing and drinking and eating as a form of expression and being, okay? So I think the more that we think about our role in communities as that, we also have to move the conversation from the powers that be in a community from 
Oh, can you please give me some, sir, to do our little play? Two, can you afford not to support what we're doing for downtown? Can you afford not to have us teaching your children? Can you afford not to have us helping other non for profits raise money in this community? So it takes the realm of art making out of being this luxury thing to being something that's critical. That said, we have to think about in casting, what is the story that we're trying to tell? And we have to stop with this myth that we are this post-racial society where people don't see color. Right. This cycle and eight years of Barack Obama, whom I love him like, love him, has proven, <laughs> has proven to us that we are not in a post-racial society. Right that we still have work to do as far as race is concerned. And so in that, we have to take full responsibility for the, for the stories that we tell on stage. And kind of going back to my own shortcoming, I wanted to play Judd Fry because I'm a baritone with tenor tendencies, but there's, there are no baritone roles written in musical theater, okay? And Judd Fry is one of those parts, I knew that Dick Jenkins, who is, was our director, uh, Oscar nominated, Emmy winning, that guy's the best. He and his uh, wife, uh, Sharon Jenkins, directed Oklahoma, and I knew that they were going to also add in the song Lonely Room, which is always cut from the musical back into Oklahoma, which gives Judd his humanity. It's after the, after the whole uh, the poor Judd is dead, would you kill yourself scene, Judd Fry is left in the smoke house because he sings this gorgeous baritone song called Lonely Room, and it's always cut from the musical because no one's been interested in Judd's humanity. No one's, they were, we're all interested in the iconic story of Curly and Lori falling in love and the frontier and blah, blah, blah. But that's a, this is a very, Oklahoma's a very dark story about people living on the frontier but living within, it, quote, a Native American territory. And this Judd Fry character is a character whom the authors have insinuated is a person and through the text is one of darker complexion. But no one's ever gone there because we have not been interested in that part of that American story. Okay? So they were like, we're going to add that song back in, and we want to go there. I'm like, great, I want to sing that song. That's why I wanted that part. It never crossed my mind that every time I stood in that smokehouse, and I had that white, my white dear friend, Charlie Thurston, who's a fierce curly, trying to convince me to kill myself, it never occurred to me that our black audience members and white audience members and woke audience members on whatever level saw that as a lynching. It never occurred to me. That's my fault. And I'm trying to get better about that. Because of course, I'm trying to unshackle myself from my previous notions about being an actor and making the rent and having to take the job and not thinking about that stuff because I gotta eat. I gotta <laughs> versus I have to think about those things. Especially now that I am in a community that's allowing me to have space and license and agency. I got time to think about it now, and I better think about it. Otherwise, I'm gonna be extinct as an artist. Ain't nobody gonna wanna come see me and my bullshit if I'm not taking into account what other folks are thinking about. You understand what I'm saying? So my position in my company has given me this grace, but we have to all find the space and courage to ask these same questions in our work because folks ain't gonna stand for it. And thank God for you young people, y'all are calling us out on it. And that has to continue. It has to continue, I, I think. That's great. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw up one question and I'll, I'll, I'll turn, yeah, go ahead and then I wanna go back oh, to me. the lighting the range, yes. Yeah, okay, so with the rise of Hamilton, there's obviously a lot of talk of what is colorblind casting versus colored conscious casting, and what do you think the conversation should be with that? Because colorblindness is a thing that obviously, you, you spoke to this, that is not a beneficial thing to say that we're living in post-racial America, because that's clearly not true with black Americans innocently dying all over, like, less than 28 hours probably every day. So what are your thoughts on theater, some theater people, particularly like white liberals saying that, oh, it's colorblind casting versus color conscious? I, I don't know if anyone's saying color, I mean, are people still saying colorblind? I feel like in the theater we're not saying I mean, colorblind anymore. I mean, they're, they're yeah, the, I, 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 I literally am writing a book on this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Uh, so, and I was just having this conversation, because there is one place where you still do truly see colorblind casting, and that's usually in classical theater. Because yeah. you can have a Shakespeare play where, you know, Polonius is white and Laertes is black, and it's not supposed to mean anything. It's not part, like, these related characters are different ethnicities, 
And it, I mean, even though we as an audience will see that these people are different colors, like we're not blind, but it doesn't have meaning within the context of the story. That still exists, but really, I only see it really in, in classical theater is the only place that you really see that. Because as you get closer to uh, the modern day, I think people would re start to read more into it. Um, in the case of Hamilton, I mean, that is very conscious. I mean, right. it's not blind at all. It's, it's extremely purposeful. Um, and that is another way to look at, at casting that you know is relatively uncommon, but still is a part of what's going on. But then there's this idea of just being like open, which is not what's happening in Hamilton, right. which is, okay, I'm just gonna find the best actor, the person who I think is best for this role, and it doesn't matter if what race that person is, or maybe even what gender that person is, I'm looking for the best actors, I'm doing something open. So there are different ways of approaching this idea, but I think it's really careful to, I think that sometimes in, in a desire to be progressive, we can forget that there's a reason that certain stories are told a certain way. Um, there's a reason you can't do like, an all white raisin in the sun. <laughs> like, you know, like, right. it doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like, it won't make any sense. You can't do it with Ibsen. I mean, Ibsen, you could change around, right? Well, I mean, I was I was saying earlier that when when I was in college, back before I decided I wanted to stop acting because I didn't want to play maids for the rest of my life, um, I was in an Ibsen play. I was in The Master Builder. And that's true. And I was the only person of color in that Yes, um, I think so. It's been a while. Um, but again, that was in an academic setting where academic settings are very different than professional settings. Um, I think that you guys know that. Also, people, I think film is very different than theater. I think that in theater, there's a much, there's more openness to casting people of color in roles that are. You know, there's a, in New York, there's a Sense and Sensibility running where one of the sisters is played by a black actress and it's not supposed to mean anything, you know, it's just like, she was a great actress, let's have her play this role. So, but you don't, you wouldn't see that in film typically, mm -hmm. unless it were an experimental film. You really wouldn't see like a Sense and Sensibility film where one of the actors was, was you know, a person of color. So. To answer your question, yeah, the, like, all these things still exist in their own way, and I think each project has its own approach. But one thing I like to also point out is that casting has also gotten more and more specific, though, because 30 years ago, you wouldn't, no one would expect necessarily that a disabled role would be played by a disabled actor. Mm -hmm. And now that's starting to change slowly. Um, so yeah, so uh, there's also more specificity. It's like if a role, uh, 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 oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor who's the lead male actor on Fresh on the Boat, Fresh Off the Boat. Um, no, the the father, um, Randall, Randall Park, Randall Park, right. And I think, I wanna get this right, he is Korean, I believe, yes. And there are people who feel like he shouldn't be in that role because he's Korean and not Chinese. So. And that's a discussion that would be like, oh, he's Asian, what are you complaining about 30 years ago? So uh, there's a lot to, to, to talk about within that. Yeah. Can I throw onto this, the, this conversation? You talked about the production of Jesus in India that was canceled on a college campus. You know, even if you look around this room, we're challenged in some ways in some college communities, different than professionally, where one can argue, oh, you cast a wider net but there are smaller towns, smaller theater companies or colleges where there's a desire to, to use your freight, you know, to widen the range of, of the narratives, to expose everybody to different ways of telling the story. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the story about the, the cancellation of the production of Jesus in India was disturbing on a number of levels, both because it was clear the playwright's intentions weren't being honored, but maybe for those of us in certain academic settings where we're trying to stretch the narratives, how do we handle it then? If we can't meet the playwright's intentions, 
Does that mean we don't get access to that voice in that community? Can we meet it halfway? This is, uh, there's two parts to this question. Yep. One is about the academic setting. The other is uh, kind of going back to your question about color uh, blind versus color conscious. In regards to the color blind and color conscious thing, I think the terminology doesn't really matter because I think that uh, it's very hard to disrupt existing power structures and the existing power structure co-ops and benefits from new terminology that you create to try to create a distinction and they'll sort of swallow that up. And so I think that like the heart of your question is really about like how did Hamilton disrupt the existing power structure which was by, you know, very actively placing uh, people of color in these uh, in these sort of iconic uh, roles to sort of broaden who has access to the legacy of, of the building of America, uh, which all immigrants do. And so, I, the, I guess what I'm saying is that like people came up with this term colorblind to try to you know to try to create more diversity, and that got swallowed in. So now you're coming up with this color conscious, and it's just like so. I think that it, it's it's sort of a it's a smokescreen, and, and so I just want to put that out there that um, really what it is is about um, democratizing democratizing kind of access and. Um, yeah. Uh, in regards to the sort of university thing, I mean, I think that that's, that's really tricky because um, I didn't really get uh, a lot of um, training in business practice um, in undergrad, and I think that sometimes in an academic setting there's this sort of like follow your dreams, like uh, kind of, you know, art is for everybody kind of stuff that, that doesn't actually match up when you try to do this professionally, and I think that it creates a lot of room for... Um, uh, for, you know, like, using a, a writer's work in a way that's not intended, and so I think that you really have to, if you're going to use it against the writer's intention, that you either find other material or that you really contextualize for the students that sort of like, this is how this would be done professionally, because I think otherwise I think you're doing a disservice to students who are coming out in the professional field and thinking that, like, directing means my interpretation over, you know, sort of like run roughshod over this person's work. So mm -hmm. I think that... Um, Only certain schools are directing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but nonetheless, though, I just think that um, it really requires uh, doing a lot of searching for material that, like, fits the uh, students that you have, and it requires um, being sensitive to kind of how uh, presenting the work in this way will be perceived and, um, and contextualizing. Other questions? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so there were two things that you two said that I liked, but I feel like they contradict, and I agree with both of them. Um, <laughs> that would be the profession. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, you, you said, um, and I agree with this being an actor, um, that I can only approach a role from my 20 years on this earth and from my experiences. And then you said that when it comes to telling stories, there is this like weird sort of thing that if a person of color is in a role, that, that, mean it has to, that means it has to mean something. But we're trying to veer away from that. So sort of where's the happy medium between those things? Because yes, I can only be, approach a role as an Indian American woman um, growing up in the South. But then how, like, how can I do that? And then also with a context of I don't want that to matter as much as it does. <coughs> But that's why it's so multi-layered, right? Because right. it's like you as an individual are advocating for yourself and you're trying to see yourself in sort of as wide a range of roles as possible, but then there's also kind of on the producer's side like uh, politics to what am I presenting, do you know what I mean? So it's like, I think that the reason why you're sensing the conflict there is because they do abut against each other because if you as an actor sort of pre presume that you're completely universal and can be in every role and don't sort of you know, recognize some of the inherent limitations that that's, that's bad, but at the same time, if you sort of self-select out of things that you would be eligible for, that's bad too, because then they don't get to see you, and, you know, and audiences don't get to kind of widen sort of who could possibly fit that role. So it's like, I think that, you, you know, if you're, if you're advocating for yourself as much as possible, you're kind of doing your job, and you're seeing yourself, you know, the humanity of, um, you know, what you're bringing into a wide range of roles, but then I think that when you have your producer hat on, or the producers who are going to cast you, they also have to think about what are the optics of this, of casting you, and you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So there, there, is, there is actually kind of a, an inherent friction there. Um, I w I'd love to throw out into the mix, too, the phrase cultural appropriation, 
and how that plays into choices, artistic choices, thinking of the Mother Courage production and the conflicts around CSC, for those of you, this was a production of Mother Courage, <coughs> where the there was a context of a different culture being put on the play, not, not incorrectly per se, in terms of taking a play by Brecht and setting it in a different culture, but then issues around how the director and the actor disagreed on how that culture in the context of the play was being used. I'm being sort of intentionally vague here, but wondering what your thoughts are on how casting plays in to cultural narratives and where it's okay to transform something. And I'm guessing the answer is in the specificity and the consciousness and the context. But <coughs> what are your thoughts on that phrase? I can, I can only respond to that uh, based upon just kind of piggybacking off of something that we've talked about. You know, I just returned from uh, the TCG National Conference in D.C., and that's all we're talking about right now is, is, is race, diversity, and inclusion. And one specific issue that's been coming up quite a bit, actually, in talking about these classic stories is there's discussion right now within the theater about, and I think this applies to film in, in every genre, what stories should we still be telling? Right. Right, right. There's a school of thought that feels like we shouldn't be doing Shakespeare. We, that I, as an African-American artist, shouldn't be in Shakespeare. Or we shouldn't be doing these plays anymore. What's their value now? Mm -hmm. So we're also grappling with, you know, these wonderful stories that I love. What I love about the classics is the fact that we have these universal stories that, that people of all races and cultures can right. find access to. Right. These kinds of big... Uh, 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 stories about L in the big word and lust with the big L and death, big D, and these big issues. And, and this discussion about whether we should be doing these. Now, I love Shakespeare. You know, I love, I want to go through every part that I can possibly play in. But there's, there's, there's a real discussion about whether it's appropriate now and whether we should put these things aside. Um, and I disagree with that. I disagree with it strongly. I think there's a place for these classic stories. I think there's a place for all of us to find access in this common humanity on stage. But we have to just take this by case by case basis, and we have to all think about this from this new lens. And from this, I'm not. I shouldn't say new. I should say a lens that's been cleaned a little bit, that's been sharpened. As the, as the focus is sharpened, we can now approach all these plays uh, in thinking about race in this kind of way. And knowing again, I keep going back to the simple. Thing. The images that we put on stage, how we use bodies of color in space, in juxtaposition, with white bodies in certain kinds of stories, tell certain, they have, they have power. They have historical power, and we can't deny that. And we have to keep, stop pretending in this world of make-believe, yep. where we're all given license and agents to just make up shit, because if we do, that has, we can't do that anymore. We have respond, it has, a, it has power. And I guess it's maybe reminding us that our work does have power. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Going back to the thing, it's our luxury item. What we do is important. And um, so I guess that's how I answer that question. Um, I just think we have to just be careful on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, I, I'll say one more thing about this. We had a big discussion even, I hope I'm not outing anybody that's maybe watching at home, about even whether uh, our play, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, what it was about. And because we were making certain casting choices in that show, People wanted that play to be about something that it wasn't. And I kept saying, no, you guys, y'all can make all the choices you want about mixing it up and having white people do this and black people do this. But this, place, this play is about race. And y'all ain't going to tell me this play ain't about race. This play ain't about a coming to age story. This play ain't about Scout learning how to be. It ain't about that. <laughs> you know, so in trying to apologize, not apologize. In trying to justify the choices that we make on stage, because we somehow, somehow, sometimes we're being too cute and too clever by half, yeah. cool. we have to just be able to say what a play is about. Okay? I don't want to see an all black cast death of a salesman. I really don't. <laughs> I think that play, is, that play is uniquely about a specific experience in, in, in American culture, just as August Wilson is, just as uh, Raising the Sun is. And so we have to just be honest about those things and allow things to be what they are and for whom they are for. But we have that luxury now that now that we have a long way to go, but there's more access yeah. for folk. When there was less access, we were having a different conversation. But there is more access. We have a lot of work to do to provide more access and money towards supporting playwrights and supporting dramaturgs and directors and, and filmmakers to, to, to create stories that we are not passers by in or we happen to be in but are about and for us. We have to be better about that. Um, but we got to just take it on a case by case basis. Another question. Yeah. Hey, Damon. Um, yeah. Sort of going off of that, the notion of um, what sort of classical stories are worth still being part of the cultural narrative of sort of the, the, the body politic. 
coming outside of white Western classical theater, how do we approach other classical tales from around the world with this sort of color consciousness in mind while also avoiding then it becoming just completely imperialized by white performers? How do we start to yeah. allow for more narrative? That's a great question. Oh, I wish I didn't have a mic right now. <laughs> I think from, from my point of view, this, this starts with number one in education and how we educate young people, especially in consortiums and in training programs. That, you know, we again, and I'm talking about, you, we talk about audiences being bamboozled when we say, oh, we want y'all to come, but when you come, you come and watch some image, you're like, Jesus, y'all don't want me to be here. So we have to be responsible for folks who welcome into the space. The same thing is with our young people who we ask to come and spend three years in the master's program or four years in the BA program. That we, we can't just say, well, you know, traditionally we've, this has been a unit on Shakespeare. We have, we, as we invite people of color and people of all the spectrums that we have, we have to adjust how we train kids and how we provide spaces. We have to provide support. There has to be a mechanism. You can't just invite people and say, come, and we want you, and then they get there, and they're like, well, oh, shit. <laughs> Ain't nothing here for me. Okay? So, and that's, and I, and I know that's something that we, I'm not saying we're good at it. Trinity and Brown, our program, we are struggling with that right now. And I'm, I'm having conversations with our kids all the time. And they're like, Joe, we, and we have, the, we have as, and I'm so proud of this, we have one of the most diverse classes in the history of our program this year. And they all come to me and say, Joe, I'm happy to be here and see all these black and colored faces, but I'm here now. What are we going to do? What are you going to do for me? You know, and so we're working through that. We're working through that. So that, that's going to require the white power holders, stakeholders in these institutions working in concert with their students and working in concert with everybody to know it's about curriculum too. That we can't be training kids from a traditional sort of white western or European notion about what's a classic. That we, so that's going to require our people in power to become less lazy right. and do some homework and go back to school. You know what I mean? Because we have people who have been teaching in these institutions for a very long time out of one thing and they like something simple as, ain't nobody talking fourth wall no more. That was a technique when I went to school, you know, with fourth wall and made my magic. Nobody's talking about that. So our techniques are antiquated. So we, we, we got we to, how we teach, the methods that we use, and all of us have to go back to school and stop being lazy. And that includes people in power. But there, there is a combination of, of, in the conversation, you can't do in the red and brown water without reading Lorca. That's right. Okay? <laughs> so you need your Lorca in there with red and brown water. Now, I don't know if Lorca counts, you know, on what classics grid Lorca lives, but you do end up in these conversations of how these writers are in dialogue with each other and impacting each other. So you do need to stay awake, right? But but you can't just say, okay, it all starts in, you know, in 2000. You, you've got to figure out where the conversation is. Or something yes? as stupid as, we love talking about the musicality of Shakespeare, but we can't, we don't know how to even begin talking about we the musicality no of Wilson. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. That there's something, and that jazz aesthetic is something very, very specific. Who's teaching that? Mm -hmm. oh, we, I know people, but right. it's not as many as right. folks as who are willing right, to take right, up right. a Shakespeare no, class. Absolutely right. So it's this kind of stuff that we have to, that has to be part of our, right. our lexicon, a part of our terminology. You were going to say something. I cut you off. Oh, um, no, I was just going to say that um, I find it fascinating because I think that all these things are important. Like, like since I don't. I mean, I'm part of like an academic world, but I don't like engage in it as deeply as you do. So I'm like the idea of like not studying Shakespeare anymore is just like I'm like what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Which was um, Wilson's argument, right? Way back. Yeah. Well, it, um, it was. A, I was there. I was at that conference. He was part there. of it. Yeah. Part of it. Um, but I will say that I think that it's not about excluding things from the canon. It's about including. So it's not like, oh, we should stop studying yeah. this. I think it's about, we should start studying this as well. Right. We should start looking at stories that weren't necessarily written down, mm. yeah. but are a part of culture and that are passed down in another way. Right. I think that uh, in academia, we uh, put a certain amount of emphasis on the written word, word and written uh -huh. tradition over cultural tradition and over performance tradition, even in like performance studies. Um, and I think it takes looking at that and looking at what is there to learn from whole cultures that didn't necessarily write down their stories in the same way. 
because I think one of the reasons, and don't get me wrong, I love Shakespeare, it's great, but one of the reasons that he's endured is because it's written down. Yeah, yeah. Because even his contemporaries haven't endured as well, and they could have been great, but maybe they just didn't survive as well because they weren't written down and so they lost the folio or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, or they weren't written in English or for all these other, all these other reasons, right? Um, but I will also say, as someone who does a lot of like professional work, like nobody cares about that once you get in the commercial world. Nobody cares. <laughs> so which part? Any of it. <laughs> in, in the commercial world, like no, nobody cares about studying. Nobody cares about cultural appropriation. Like no, nobody, nobody cares. It's just it's it's uh, a lot of these deep discussions that you have when you're in school that are great and will inform everything you do. You get into a commercial space and no one cares, um, and that's just like not at all what's what's happening. So, um, so yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm so sorry we don't have Edie Velasco on that front to talk about some of the casting choices that they've made on Transparent along these lines, right, and where they've honored some of these things that have been yeah. Happened. But I also feel like I wonder sometimes, like. You know when you look at like a movie from like a hundred years ago or seventy five years ago, you know, you look at um, you know the Good Earth. You haven't yeah. seen that movie. Um, Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Yeah, yeah, where you have um, oh gosh, what's her name, Louise Reiner, like in like yellow, like actual yellow, like full on yellow face. Um, she won an Oscar for that, and how at the time that was like prized, and now we're like cringing. And I wonder if like 75 years from now, 100 years from now, people are gonna look at things that we love now and be cringing and saying like, ooh, how could they have done that? Like, like and I know you can't, you can't create art for future generations. Like it can't be like, oh, I need to create this hoping that a future generation will, it'll fit their, um, you know, sensibilities, but I do wonder about that sometimes. I'm like, if what we're doing now, are people going to be like, oh gosh, things were so backward back then, you know, in 75 years. <laughs> yeah, hopefully well, there's progress. The last question, because it is, it's 4 o'clock, so I'm trying to be good about time. Was it someone, yeah? So Ridley Scott said about this movie, um, uh, Gods and Kings, that the reason that he couldn't cast people who were not white in um, his roles was because he couldn't hire Muhammad so-and-so from such and such and on a multi-million dollar film and expect people to show up to the theaters. The next year he gets nominated for an Oscar in a really controversial Oscar season. And the only, one of the few only non-white people in his movie is extremely stereotyped into his role. Do you think that people's art should stand on its own or that him being nominated for an Oscar a year after this happened almost reinforces the idea that it's okay to say these sorts of things if you have that much power. I mean, I think it catches up with you. Like, <laughs> like he, he was already, you know, a really respected filmmaker before that, but I think that um, he's going to be swallowed by time. And um, so in the short term, like, he can get away with it, but I think that, uh, yeah, audiences are demanding more thoughtfulness. And I also think that, um, on the producing side of things that uh, were not being, um, the, the idea of like sort of like a bankable star, like I can't, you know, I can't cast this person because I need these stars, like it, it wasn't born out in the box office for that movie, that movie completely tanked and so, um, and we're guilty of this in, in theater a lot too because we, um, I think pay too much stock in, in like New York Times reviews but like yeah. the, um, but what those reviews say don't necessarily, um, correlate directly with like how um, how well the show does. Um, so uh, when we start making decisions, listening to audiences and sort of like looking at, at like the actual results rather than kind of, you know, using <laughs> select facts to confirm our biases, I think will be a lot healthier as an industry. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I was just gonna oh, no. say really quickly, um, in relation to that, uh, I think that it's important to know the difference between like public opinion, box office, and like the industry. Because the industry, especially the film industry, is relatively small. And really, Scott is really well established in that industry. And frankly, a lot of people in that industry think exactly the way he does. So to them, him saying that isn't a big deal. Of course, they're going to nominate him for an Oscar. They think the same way. 
Um, and you know what Mike said is totally right. That film totally bombed, as did like the other movie with the with Gerard Butler as uh, what was that one called? I don't remember. Gods of Egypt. Thank you. When I think of Egypt, I think of Gerard Butler. Um, but but I think that it's it's also though those films didn't do well at the box office. But there's also a question of getting the money in the first place. Yeah. And they were able to get the money in the first place. So there is this disconnect between maybe, you know, I'm not saying he's right, but I'm saying maybe it does help to have a white person in the lead to get the money mm. in the first place. Mm. Right. Well, it does. I'm sure it does. So, um, but does that mean that you should cast, like, white people as Egyptians? No. But there is a place in between that that's like, well, why is that? Why is that the issue? And I think that's a question for like all of us to figure out. Like, why, why is like a white man considered bankable and mm. everyone else a risk? Right, mm -hmm. right. I think that's the, the question at the core of that. Right, and there's a huge gender piece in that too. I love that because it also brings up in my our realm of, of theater in that you know, especially as we're talking more about race and diversity and inclusion, this has become big business. Talking about race in the workplace or in the theater and trying to do the right thing and become big business. And what that's translated to is there are people in our fields who have been advocates and working on the front lines for justice and inclusion within our field. But now it's become a big thing and there's mul millions of dollars being thrown at directors or institutions to work, quote, on developing this kind of work. It's important to remember that there are people in this field who have been advocates for a very long time during this work. And just because now we're hip to it, and because now there's money to be made from it, we ain't inventing the wheel. So don't disservice people of color who have been advocates in this industry for a very long time and throw money at white institutions or white directors to do this stuff. There are people that we can invest in now that have been on the front lines forever. It's disrespectful to assume that we are reinventing the wheel around this issue. So it's uh, that we've never made me think about how we advocate our resources in whether it be film or TV or in the theater. It's like there are people that we should be giving millions of dollars to that we don't. We don't, and we are still refusing to provide space and access for, for people of color and and uh, and gender and and uh, all across the the board. So we have to just check ourselves about the, the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken. It's like we are not making this up. And, and Mike, this speaks directly to your to, to some of the things you've said, uh, at least on Hell Round, I know, about how important it is to have a group of writers of Asian descent or theaters of color. I mean, I'm linking this back to August Wilson's speech in 96 at DCG, which was about white institutions being given the money to do the color conscious casting as opposed to the African American theaters, which he said at the time were in danger of dying, right? Mm. I mean, that was kind of the, the, the core of his very revolutionary taking a far stance of saying, why are we using actors of color in white institutions instead of supporting institutions of color? So, over to you. What's the, well, <laughs> I, well, I, I agree. Your, right. <laughs> <laughs> well said. No, I mean, I, uh, I think that all of this really comes to sort of a, a thoughtlessness and, and that um, we should be more thoughtful and the more thoughtful we are, the more that uh, other people will gravitate towards us. And, you know, so a lot, like in the same way that uh, I think that people are really like more discerning now about like the ingredients in their food and like huge mm -hmm. sort of, you know, like Nabisco or whatever, the, or whatever they're like, uh, the, you know, like just like giant giant corporations that don't think about these ingredients, and then all of a sudden, all their customers are like, "I'm not going to eat this, you know, yoga mat in my burger." And like, yeah. so like, we are now at a point, I think, in in the arts where you're like, "I'm not going to pay to, you know, be misrepresented, or I'm not going to pay to be excluded." And the more thoughtful we are about um, about casting, the more people will buy into it. So, it, it, yeah. That's a good, I think we should maybe end on that now.